This is chapter seven, membrane structure and function. So in this chapter, we'll look at how the membrane plays a role in maintaining cell homeostasis by regulating inbound and outbound traffic of molecules. So some molecules we'll see are able to pass directly across the membrane um, using passive transport um, or with the assistance of transport proteins, but passive meaning it does not require any energy. Some small molecules use active transport um, with the assistance of a transport protein. Um, so it does require energy to actively pump molecules across the membrane. And larger molecules are able to move in and out of the cell via bulk transport through vesicles, either exocytosis outside of the cell or endocytosis inside of the cell. Looking at the structure of the cell membrane, so cell membranes are considered to be fluid mosaics of mainly lipids with some interspersed proteins. So the primary component of the cell membrane is the phospholipid bilayer. Um, and then throughout the membrane, we have these different proteins embedded. Um, some are kind of permanently fixed in the membrane and some are able to kind of float and bob around. But it's called the fluid mosaic because the membrane is kind of fluid, kind of an oily, wiggly consistency. Um, but mosaic is in we have lots of small pieces working together to make up the whole picture of the membrane. So we've talked about before how phospholipids comprise the cell membrane. Right, so phospholipids are considered amphipathic, right, so meaning they have two opposing ends. So think kind of an amphibian is both in land and water. So amphipathic molecules have a hydrophobic or water-fearing region, which would be the tails, and hydrophilic or water-loving regions on the heads. So the cell membrane is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. I mean, we have a double layer of these phospholipids with the hydrophobic tails facing inward toward one another. So they are away from the fluid inside and outside of the cell. The hydrophilic heads are on the outside of the membrane and they are exposed to the watery environment inside and outside the cell. We said the membrane was called a fluid mosaic. So it usually has kind of that oily consistency, has a little bit of give and wiggle to it. Um, but it is able to change its fluidity um, depending on its environment. So as temperatures cool, membranes are able to switch from a fluid state to a more solid state. So this is going to depend on the types of lipids that make up those membranes. So Remember we talked about unsaturated versus saturated fatty acids. So if they're saturated, the tails um, are more linear, we can pack them in more tightly. Right? So if you have more saturated phospholipids, um, you're going to have a more rigid cell membrane right? because we can pack more of those in together. There's not as much wiggle room between those tails. Whereas if we have the unsaturated fatty acid tails, right, they have more kinks in their tails. So it's going to prevent that tight packing and it's going to make the membrane more fluid and less viscous or thick. Cell membranes also contain cholesterol, which was a steroid, which is another type of lipid um, in animal cells that's going to play a role in the degree of fluidity in the membrane at different temperatures. So at relatively higher temperatures, like body temperature, cholesterol is going to restrain the movement of the phospholipid. So it's going to make it a little more stable and sturdy, so it's not too wiggly. At low temperatures, it's going to maintain the fluidity by preventing that tight packing. So it's going to take up space um, just to have a little bit more give and wiggle room in the membrane so it doesn't become too rigid and viscous. So it's going to reduce the fluidity or the movement of the membrane at moderate temperatures by reducing how much these phospholipids can move, but it's also going to hinder solidification of the membrane at lower temperatures by preventing that tight packing of the phospholipids. Membranes have to remain somewhat fluid to work properly. So the fluidity of the membrane is going to affect its permeability or the ease in which substances can cross the membrane. Um, and the movement of those transport proteins that assist with moving things across the membrane. So if the membrane is too fluid, so it's too wiggly and oily, um, 
it's not going to be able to support the protein function. So the proteins would essentially just kind of float away. They wouldn't be able to be stable in the membrane where they're needed. So the composition of the types of lipids in cell membranes can um, adapt to specific environmental conditions in some species. So, for example, in ice fish that live in extreme cold environments, right, they have more unsaturated phospholipid in their um, cell membrane. So it's going to maintain some flexibility um, despite those cold temperatures. Their membrane is still going to be fluid, whereas goldfish, who typically reside in more moderate temperatures, um, they have more saturated hydrocarbon tails in their phospholipids. And so they have more viscous cell membranes. The fluid mosaic is composed of the phospholipids that comprise the main fabric of the membrane, um, but the mosaic is going to be made up of these different proteins throughout. Um, and the proteins are what's really going to determine most of the membrane's function um, in allowing things in or out of the cell, as well as communicating with other cells and attaching to other cells. The type of proteins in a cell membrane can vary among different cells, so between muscle cells or nerve cells and skin cells, and among different species. So of the membrane proteins, there are two main categories. So you can have peripheral proteins, which are mainly attached on the periphery or on the edge or surface of the membrane. Right? So it's kind of on the surface or on the edge. They don't go all the way through the membrane. Whereas your integral proteins um, are a more integral part of the membrane structure. So they're going to span um, and penetrate through that hydrophobic core. So they're going to go through the hydrophobic tail region. So these transmembrane proteins are integral proteins that are going to span the entire thickness of the membrane. So they'll be similar in composition to the membrane where they have hydrophobic regions in the middle part where they pass through or span through this hydrophobic region of the membrane with these nonpolar amino acid um, helices. And then the hydrophilic regions will be on the ends, right? same as the phospholipids, because it's going to be exposed to the fluid environment. Some membrane proteins are held in place by attachment to the cytoskeleton inside the cell. So remember last chapter we talked about the cytoskeleton and those microfilaments um, and things that help support the overall structure of the cell. Right? Um, so some of these proteins can attach to that cytoskeleton, so they're firmly embedded right, in their precise location in the membrane. There are other proteins that can attach to materials outside of the cell and part of that extracellular matrix. Um, so things like integrins um, can attach to some of these fibers like collagen fibers outside the cell in the extracellular matrix. Membrane proteins on the cell surface can carry out several functions depending on their shape and structure. So some membrane proteins function in transport. So we'll look at different types of transport and different types of transport proteins. So you can have some channel proteins that act like little passageways for ions and things to travel across the membrane. Um, we have more specific carrier proteins that carry specific molecules across. Some membrane proteins function as enzymes. Remember, enzymes are just proteins, so we can have specific enzyme proteins in the membrane to help facilitate and catalyze certain chemical reactions. So we talked about in the last chapter, the mitochondria undergo cellular respiration to make ATP. So that is a chemical reaction that is going to utilize enzymes in the membrane um, of the mitochondria. Some membrane proteins work for signal transduction, so they can receive signals from other cells um, and then send those messages to trigger a response from the host cell. So um, things like hormones. Right? So when the cell receives a hormone signal, it binds to that receptor, that protein receptor. Cell to cell recognition. So some proteins recognize and bind to some of those identifying carbohydrate chains or your glycoproteins on the surface of another cell. So remember we talked about those self-identifying markers or flags on the surface of a cell. Intercellular joining, so like some of those tight junctions or desmosomes that we talked about um, in the last chapter of cell connections, so how cells physically attach to one another to form continuous tissues and things like that.
Um, and then we mentioned attachment to the cytoskeleton or extracellular matrix, just again to offer some extra support to the overall structure of the cell. So membrane proteins that act as um, surface receptors um, are going to play an important role in medical applications. So one example um, is the HIV virus. It enters our immune system cells by binding to one of those protein receptors on the immune cell uh, membrane on the surface. So some individuals naturally have no um, receptor, so they're missing the gene for one of these co-receptors. So therefore, the HIV virus is not able to bind and attach to their cells, therefore making them essentially um, immune or resistant to HIV infection. So there are currently some drugs in development that kind of artificially will block or mask this co-receptor um, in non-immune individuals. So it prevents the HIV virus from attaching to the cells in the first place and causing an infection. Another example would be the ACE2 protein receptors on our own cell membranes, um, so like lung cell membranes have these ACE2 receptors that the spike protein of the coronavirus can bind to right, and cause infection. So one potential treatment could be, um, or preventative could be, looking at drugs that can block that ACE receptor and prevent the SARS-CoV-2 virus from attaching to the cells and causing infection in the first place. The cells recognize each other by binding to molecules on the surface of the membrane. So we said these glycoproteins, glycolipids, are mainly kind of self-identifying markers um, to allow other cells to recognize and distinguish between me and not me. So this one way how our immune system works, to recognize foreign cells versus your own cells. So many of these surface molecules are bonded to these short little chains or branches of carbohydrates. So glycolipids are these carbohydrate chains that come off of the lipid portion of the membrane, and glycoproteins are carbohydrate chains coming off of a membrane protein. So again, the diversity and overall structure, recognizable structure of these surface carbohydrates is what enables them to function as markers for cell identification. So if your immune system fails to recognize the surface markers, that could lead to something like an autoimmune disease. So again, going back to the underlying theme of structure reflects function. So the structure of the membrane is going to result in its function as a selectively permeable membrane. So this just means that it's going to tightly regulate and control the exchange or movement of materials between the cell and its surroundings. So basically some substances are able to cross the membrane more easily than others. So this is how the cell maintains homeostasis. So we can obtain from the environment precisely what we need when we need it. So this fluid mosaic structure it helps explain how the membranes regulate this molecular traffic across the membrane. Phospholipids are amphipathic, so they have a hydrophilic region and a hydrophobic region. So the hydrophobic region of the lipid bilayer is going to allow other hydrophobic or nonpolar or lipid soluble molecules to essentially pass through the membrane directly kind of dissolve through. So some hydrocarbons like CO2 and oxygen can kind of pass directly through the membrane through simple diffusion. On the other side of the coin, this hydrophobic interior is going to repel the hydrophilic or polar molecules. So things like sugars and water and ions pass through much more slowly, if at all. They may need to rely on some assistance from the proteins in the membrane. So basically remember like dissolves like so lipid soluble substances will be able to pass through this lipid membrane right so lipid soluble means it's able to dissolve in lipids the membrane is lipid so they can slip right through whereas oil and water do not mix so the water soluble or hydrophilic molecules so sugar is dissolvable in water right, um, would be repelled by this lipid membrane the simplest most straightforward type of passive transport would just be simple diffusion where these lipid soluble molecules can pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer with no extra intervention or assistance. Very simple.
But the hydrophilic substances, things like sugar and some ions, um, would need to rely on the assistance of some of these membrane transport proteins. So there are two main categories of membrane proteins. You can have channel proteins that are basically kind of a tunnel or a channel that goes through the membrane that certain molecules or ions can pass through. And then you have carrier proteins that are going to bind to molecules and change shape to help ferry them across the membrane. So it's a little bit more selective, but it's still a passive process. One specific type of channel protein is called an aquaporin. Um, so this is basically a water pore. So this is going to facilitate the transport of water molecules across the membrane through osmosis. Most transport proteins are going to move only specific substances. So glucose carrier proteins are only capable of transporting glucose. Right? So they won't transport other types of sugars because they essentially won't fit in the shape of this protein. So this is another factor into that selective permeability of the membrane. So it's dependent on both the lipid bilayer structure and the specific type and shape of transport proteins in that membrane. So when we talk about passive transport, we're talking about movement of substances across the membrane with no energy. So it's a passive process, kind of hands off, or you don't have to input any energy or really do anything. It happens kind of just naturally on its own via diffusion. So diffusion is the movement of particles of a substance, basically so they spread out evenly in the available space. So it's going to go from a region of high concentration to low concentration. So most things in nature want to be at equilibrium and want to be balanced. So diffusion is how um, these molecules can try to obtain that equilibrium and that balance. So one example that we usually do in the lab, so you have a beaker of water, right? And you add a drop of dye into the beaker of water. So when you first place the drop, right, you have a little drop of the dye in the middle of the beaker, right? Um, but as time goes by, a few seconds, those dye molecules will start to diffuse and spread outward um, throughout the beaker. Um, so after a certain period of time, you have evenly dispersed the dye and the water molecules, and you have kind of a uniform color or tint now to the water. So essentially, it's been completely dissolved um, and evenly dispersed throughout the beaker of water. Um, another example that I used to do in my anatomy lab when we talked about diffusion um, is I would stand in one corner of the lab room, Right, and you have the different tables throughout the room, um, and I would spray this really strong, like, old lady perfume. Right. Um, so as students were able to smell the perfume, right, they would raise their hand. So as those perfume molecules disperse through diffusion and diffuse throughout the room, right, they're going to slowly spread to the back of the room. So what would happen is students closest to where I was standing in the front of the room Right at that table, they would be able to smell it first. And then um, lastly, the students, the far end of the room at the last table, they would be the last ones to smell it as those perfume molecules kind of diffused and spread to reach equilibrium and evenly disperse with the air molecules in the lab. The substances are always going to diffuse or spread down their concentration gradient. So the concentration gradient is just the difference between the concentration on either side of a membrane. And again, this is passive because there's no energy expended by the cell. Um, so you can think of this as rolling the ball down the hill. Okay, so this is easy, right? You just let it roll, it goes on its own, right? Um, or floating downstream, you just kind of go with the flow and the current. You don't have to actively use any energy or paddle or whatever. You can ride your bike down a hill, right? You just kind of coast and it'll go naturally. Whereas active transport would be the opposite. So now we're going uphill or against that gradient. So in that case, we would have to use some energy, right? So you would have to paddle and swim or pedal your bike up the hill. So this concentration gradient is going to represent potential energy that drives the diffusion, right? Or essentially the hill that we're going to roll down, right? The steepness of that hill. So the steeper or the greater the difference of concentrations, right? The steeper your gradient, the steeper your hill, the faster 
the diffusion can occur. But the rate of diffusion is also going to depend on how permeable that membrane is to that specific substance. So just because we may have a strong gradient, uh, we may be limited um, on the permeability based on things like type of molecule um, or number present of certain protein carriers or channels. So in this picture, we have um, some yellow molecules on the left side, purple molecules on the right side. So there's a greater concentration of yellow on this side um, than there is purple on this side. So we'll have a greater net diffusion right, of the yellow over here, and a few of the purple will diffuse over here. So they'll both kind of diffuse. Right? So here we're going from high concentration of purple to low concentration of purple, right? high concentration of yellow, to low concentration of yellow. Okay. Um, so they're starting to intermix a little bit, but we still have more yellow over here, more purple over here. They're not quite balanced at equilibrium. Right? So they'll continue to diffuse and move across this membrane until we have an even distribution right, through diffusion, right, and they reach that balance and that equilibrium. Right? So now they're all evenly dispersed throughout this solution on both sides. So once a solution reaches equilibrium, generally there's no more net movement. It will maintain that equilibrium. So we won't all of a sudden have more purple molecules start to flow back on this side. It will maintain that balance. So up until this point, we've been talking about diffusion in terms of the solutes, right, or the molecules or ions that are dissolved in a water solution. However, we can also look at the diffusion or movement of water molecules themselves um, with osmosis. So osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules across the membrane. So it's still diffusion, so we're still going from a high concentration to low concentration, um, but in terms of the water concentration as opposed to the solute concentration. So free water molecules will diffuse across the membrane from the region of a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. So basically we're going from high water to low water. Um, so these brackets just mean the concentration. So water moves from a region of high water concentration to low water concentration. Or if you want to look at it in terms of solutes, it's going to move from the region of low solute concentration or to high solute concentration. So how concentrated a solution is, you may sometimes see the term osmolality. So it's basically how concentrated, how many solutes are in that solution. So if we have low solutes, it has a low concentration, it has a low osmolality. Again, if we're talking about standard diffusion of solutes, so the red sugar molecules would diffuse to the right side of our membrane, but the water is going to diffuse through osmosis toward the left side. Right? So once it reaches equilibrium, um, then we have that even distribution between the sugar and the water molecules on both sides. So when looking at osmosis and the diffusion of water, we have to look at the tonicity of a solution. The tonicity is just the ability of the solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. So how is it going to influence that osmosis or that water movement in or out of a cell? The tonicity is going to depend, again, on the concentration of solutes, right, or the osmolality, um, how concentrated that solution is relative to what's inside the cell. Right? So our cells maintain homeostasis, so they have kind of a standard range of tonicity or concentration of solutes that they maintain. Right? So if the solution has a higher concentration of these solutes, then the water will leave the cell via osmosis. If the solution has a lower concentration than what's inside the cell, then water will rush in the cell via osmosis and cause it to swell. So water is always going to want to move to the more concentrated area to try to dilute down that more concentrated solution right, and reach equilibrium. So three types of tonic solutions. So isotonic is where the solution is already naturally at the same concentration as what's inside the cell. So it's already kind of naturally at equilibrium. There's no net gain or loss of water and the cell is happy. A hypotonic solution is 
where the solution is less concentrated, right, or there's more water in the solution than what's in the cell. Right, so inside the cell is more concentrated than the solution. So water is going to want to diffuse inside the cell right, to reach that equilibrium right, and dilute some of the internal cell contents. Right, so this can cause a cell to swell and potentially burst. So you think hypotonic. Um, hypo means below normal. So the solution is below, the concentration of the solution is below what's inside the cell. Vice versa, if we have a hypertonic solution, so the hypertonic is hyperconcentrated or overconcentrated compared to what's naturally inside the cell. So the water will want to move out of the cell through osmosis to dilute out some of this concentrated solution out here. So as a result, the cell loses water and can shrivel um, and what's called crenate. So different types of cells, animal cells or plant cells, have kind of different preferences for tonic solutions and tonicity. So a plant cell that's in a hypotonic solution will take up water right into that central vacuole, and the cell will swell um, until it presses on that cell wall. So remember, plant cells have a cell wall that gives them kind of an extra kind of rigidity layer that keeps them from bursting. The normal or the ideal solution for plant cells would be hypotonic. So that's going to completely fill that central vacuole and right, make the cell kind of completely full. Right? So this is referred to as turgid. Um, it's going to increase the turgor pressure of the, the plant cell and right? keep it from wilting. Whereas animal cells, um, we don't have a cell wall to keep our cells from swelling too much. So a hypotonic solution would cause our cells to take on so much water until they potentially lice or burst. So because we don't have cell walls, um, we can't tolerate that excessive water loss or uptake like some plant cells can. So for animal cells, we prefer isotonic solutions right, that are the same concentration as our natural cells' internal contents. Um, so we have no net movement of water. Whereas plants, um, if they're in an isotonic solution, um, their central vacuole isn't completely filled, so they're considered to be a bit flaccid. Um, and then both plants and animal cells don't like a hypertonic solution because that's going to cause the cell to lose too much water and shrivel up. Right? So in animal cells, they can shrivel or crenate. Um, in plant cells, they become what's called plasmalized. Right? So we drain all the water out of the plant cell and essentially the plant will wilt uh, and can potentially die. So some organisms that live in aquatic environments um, have to undergo osmoregulation and control their solute concentration and water balance on a regular basis because they're always surrounded by different solutions. So one example would be a paramecium, which is a type of protist, a single-celled organism um, that typically lives in a hypotonic environment. Right? So it would want to take on water through osmosis, being in a hypotonic solution. So in order to prevent um, the paramecium from taking on too much water and lysing or bursting, they have one of these contractile vacuoles that allows them to contract and expel that excess water out of their cells so that they don't get too full um, and swell too much from that hypotonic solution. Facilitated diffusion is facilitated or assisted by different transport proteins just to help speed up this passive transport of molecules across the membrane. So we talked about protein channels, so these little tunnels or channels, or more specific carrier proteins that bind to specific molecules and kind of shuttle them across the membrane. So the channel proteins provide corridors to allow specific molecules or ions to cross the membrane, so things like glucose or sodium. Aquaporins are specific protein channels for water molecules, uh, so through osmosis. So aquaporin is in a water pore or water channel. Um, and then some ion channels can facilitate the transport of ions or charged particles like sodium or potassium. Some ion channels um, have a, an extra layer of selectivity in their permeability. Um, 
called gated channels. So these channels are only going to open under specific circumstances or in response to a specific stimulus. So essentially you have to have the correct key or signal to open these channels and allow those ions to flow across the membrane. So one example would be um, in nerve and muscle cells, right, we have these gated channels that are gonna respond to a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine that binds to the specific receptor shape um, on this membrane protein. So you gotta have a specifically shaped key to open this lock on this gate. So once the nervous system sends that neurotransmitter, so it's giving the signal, the green light to start this nerve impulse or this muscle contraction, right? Then we can open the channel and allow those ions to flow across the membrane. Even though we're using the assistance of membrane proteins, it's still considered a passive transport because the solutes are still moving down that concentration gradient. So they're still rolling downhill or downstream, right? So it's not gonna require any energy. However, we are able to tap into our ATP energy source to transport solutes against that concentration gradient. So say now we want to go uphill or upstream. Right? So we're gonna just have to use a little bit of energy to pump those solutes across the membrane. So this active transport is going to use energy in the form of ATP to actively pump these substances uphill against those concentration gradients. Active transport is going to enable the cells to maintain those precise solute concentrations um, inside and outside the cell. So a classic example for active transport is the sodium potassium pump. It's very important in things like nerve impulse generation um, and muscle contraction. So example, the concentration of potassium ions is higher and the concentration of sodium ions is lower inside the cell right, than outside. Right? So if we want to pump potassium inside the cell and sodium outside of the cell, we have to use energy to go against that gradient. So natural diffusion, sodium would want to go from high to low inside, potassium would want to go from high to low outside. However, using ATP, we can um, bind, and again, they're specific, so it specifically binds to three sodium ions. Um, ATP attaches, hydrolyzes, so we cut off that third phosphate group, release the energy, right? and now the protein changes shape and essentially pumps those sodiums outside the cell right, where it's already a high concentration. Right? And in return, we pick up two potassiums, right? Um, and then when it resets, we reset the shape of the protein. Now it's going to pump those potassiums inside the cell against its gradient. So we use these ion pumps in active transport to maintain our membrane potential, which again, we said is going to be important for things like muscle contraction and nerve impulse generation. The membrane potential is just the voltage across the membrane or the difference in charges. So differences in concentrations of the ions. Remember, ions are just charged particles. So the voltage is created by differences in again, the distribution or concentration of positively charged ions or cations and negatively charged ions or anions across this membrane. So in the natural resting state, inside of the cell is going to be more negative in charge relative to the outside. So this will favor a passive transport or natural diffusion of the cations right, into the cell and the negatively charged anions out of the cell. So these two combined forces of our concentration gradient, right, so the concentration of the solutes and the voltage gradient, so the differences in the charges, is collectively referred to as the electrochemical gradient. So this is what's driving our diffusion of ions across this membrane um, and helping to regulate our membrane potential. So whenever we want to generate um, what's called an action potential, right, or say an electrical impulse or nerve impulse, um, we would open the sodium channels or the cation channels allow these positively charged cations to flow inside the cell um, and we depolarize or flip the charges so the inside of the cell would become less negative 
um, and that's what's going to ge generate that electrical impulse um, that's going to travel down the axon of a neuron. Electrogenic pumps are specific transport proteins that help generate that voltage um, and that membrane potential by storing energy that we can use for our cellular work, right, to generate those action potentials. So electrogenic just means uh, electricity generating pump. So the main type of electrogenic pump differs between plants and animals. So in animals, right, we use the sodium potassium pump. So these are the primary um, ions involved in our membrane potential and depolarization and action potential nerve impulse generation. Plants and fungi use a proton pump, which is going to actively transport using ATP um, hydrogens out of their cells. Right, so whenever we see proton, uh, we're essentially just talking about hydrogen. So remember we talked about acids and bases. Um, so acids were proton donors. That just means that they give off hydrogen. Since hydrogens only have one proton. The proton pump is going to serve essentially the same purpose in establishing that gradient, that electrochemical gradient, to facilitate other cell functions in the membrane potential. Co-transport is a type of couple transport by membrane protein that's kind of a byproduct of that initial active transport of the electrogenic proteins. Co-transport occurs when our active transport of a solute kind of indirectly or secondarily drives the secondary transport of other substances. So we said plant cells, bacteria cells, they use the proton pumps to generate hydrogen across the cell membrane. So now we've established a concentration gradient of more hydrogen outside the cell than inside the cell. So this co-transporter secondary protein will couple the movement diffusion passive diffusion of hydrogen back inside the cell down its concentration gradient to the active transport of a molecule like sucrose um, into the cell. So hydrogen will diffuse back in passively, but it's going to co-transport or assist the sucrose in transporting inside the cell actively. So this is how plants can load sucrose um, for energy into their plant veins for transport around the plant tissues. We also use a similar co-transporter mechanism to couple active transport of glucose um, to the diffusion of sodium into our intestinal cells. So we had our active transport right with our sodium potassium pump. So we're using energy to pump sodium outside the cell. Right, so now we have established a gradient. Right, so we have high concentration of sodium outside lower concentration of sodium inside. So sodium will naturally diffuse back into the cell, but it will carry along with it a co-transport of glucose. Right? So glucose um, would be going against the concentration gradient. So it needs this co-transport assistance or the secondary active transport to diffuse it across the membrane. So sodium and glucose typically will travel together inside the cell when the co-transport. So normally sodium in our waste products would just be reabsorbed in the colon to help maintain our homeostatic constant levels. However, when a person has diarrhea, excessive fluid loss, um, so they're losing waste and fluid faster than we're able to reabsorb it. So this can cause sodium levels to drop which can have more far-reaching effects, like affecting your nervous system function, muscle cell function. Um, so this is why when people are severely dehydrated, right, um, have diarrhea, it's good to drink something like Pedialyte, which is a concentrated salt um, and electrolyte solution in glucose that's going to replace and enable um, this uptake through our sodium glucose transporters in the intestine. So looking at the ingredients of something like Pedialyte, so it has lots of sugar, so 25 grams of sugar. Um, it has a ton of sodium, right, because the sodium is going to help facilitate this import of glucose in the cells as well. So up until this point, we've been talking about the transport of individual ions or small molecules like glucose and water across the cell membrane. But cells are also capable of 
bulk transport of larger solutes um, and molecules via exocytosis and endocytosis. The small molecules in water can enter and leave the cell through those transport proteins, but larger molecules like proteins, polysaccharides, um, even bacteria, uh, have to cross the membrane in bulk inside vesicles. So in exocytosis, you have transport vesicles that are going to migrate to the membrane, fuse with it, and release their contents outside the cell. So because these vesicles are made up of the same type of phospholipids, right, they can just fuse and merge with the main cell membrane and expel those contents into the extracellular fluid. So we talked about the organelles in the cell. So when we secrete proteins out of the cell, right, we use exocytosis. So many secretory cells will use exocytosis to export their products. So cells in the pancreas secrete insulin right, by this exocytosis. So remember the Golgi apparatus will package and sort these products into the vesicles and then ship them out of the membrane through exocytosis. So exo being outside the cell. Endocytosis is where we're taking up large molecules inside the cell or endo. So essentially a membrane will form a vesicle or pocket around um, the substance and pinch it off and bring it inside for transport. So there are three main types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis is basically cell eating. Right? So we will kind of extend part of the membrane out to engulf and wrap around um, a food particle or whatever we're bringing inside the cell. So this is a real little video of a white blood cell that is engulfing a bacterial cell. Penocytosis, you can think of like cellular drinking. So instead of extending outward to grasp something, we're going to draw inward. Right? So we're going to suck in some of the fluid in the extracellular fluid and drink whatever's in that fluid and bring it inside the cell. Um, and then the third type of endocytosis is just a bit more specific in that we have specific receptor proteins that are only going to bind to specific molecules. Right? So we're only going to bring in certain molecules in the cell, whereas phagocytosis or penocytosis, we're bringing in whatever we grasp. Right? Where this one, we're not going to form that vesicle until those receptors bind to a specific molecule, right? and then we can bring those in. Right, so in this example, um, these receptors only bind to the green molecule. So the red ones aren't going to be brought inside the cell. So one kind of medical application for endocytosis, this receptor-mediated endocytosis, um, is a human uptake of cholesterol. Um, so we generally uptake cholesterol um, as low-density lipoproteins. So we have specific receptor proteins um, that when they bind to this LDL, right, they'll form the vesicle through this um, receptor-mediated endocytosis, bring it inside the cell, and break it down. However, there are some individuals that have a genetic defect for those receptor proteins. So they're not able to bind to the cholesterol and bring it in their cell to break it down. So as a result, um, the cells aren't able to take the cholesterol out of the blood, and so it will accumulate and build up in the blood vessels, narrowing the space for blood flow, um, resulting in potential heart damage um, and strokes. So this condition is called hypocholesterolemia. Okay, so whenever you see emia in the word, it means we're talking about something in the blood. Remember said hyper means above normal. So they have excess or above normal levels of cholesterol in the blood.